life. Amen. If you have your Bibles, and I'm going to do the offering, I have the privilege of taking up the, the offering tonight. And I just want to share some things with you. I may be just go a little bit longer than normal, but it's really important that you understand very often we equate our generosity to the abundance we have. And so we are generous when we have an abundance. But true essence of generosity is when you are absolutely at your minimum and God requires of you. If you need a gift aid envelope, put up your hand. Everybody should have a gift aid envelope and, uh, you know, to make sure you're putting something in the offering, even if it's a pound. Because let me tell you, it's in, it is in the, the, the aspects of your lack that God brings your abundance. Amen. Amen. And I want you to understand it because sometimes people say, well, the church is doing that just because they want my money. It's too much moving around going on. Ushers, sit down now. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's like I'm in, a, I'm like in a railway station. Everybody's moving. It's like... Good. Oh. For a minute, for a minute there, I thought, am I, golly, what's going on here? Amen. Amen. Uh, didn't you like that seat? <laughs> how many? How many one? I hope that's the last time you go to the toilet. <laughs> okay, no, only kidding. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so, so you need to understand some. <laughs> the Bible says we've got to be cheerful givers. So if you're not laughing, you're crying, and then nothing happens with your giving. So you must be a cheerful giver. So, Okay. All right, then we'll just move on. And so. <laughs> I'm just not going to get this right tonight. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Oh. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, could you open up your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 8? Because a lot of times we think generosity is in, in the abundance that we have. And true generosity is not necessary in the abundance of the heart, in what we have. It is in the attitude or the abundance of God in our hearts that enables us to do the impossible. And I've seen God move over the years so incredibly in our lives and in our ministry and the things that we, you know, I always say to people, I've never known lack in the ministry. God has always taken care of us. And I can, I can show you if Pastor Chris was up here speaking of the same thing, he would tell you God has always come through, always come through. And it doesn't matter about what is in the bank account because very often we always consider what's in our bank account. But I never consider my generosity is not based upon my bank account. It's based upon his bank account. And so when God tells me to do something, even in the natural, when there is nothing there, I step out in faith and begin to believe God and see something supernatural happen. But this is a principle of the kingdom. And so we see this in that the apostle Paul is writing to the church in Corinth and he's busy telling the church in Corinth about this aspect of generosity that they need to do or need to adapt or adopt as the Macedonian church had done. And so we're going to read. He says, Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God. And that word grace is the favor and spiritual blessing of God, which has been given in the churches of Macedonia. And Macedonia, you need to understand, it was a region that was not well off. And he says, and that in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy, because that's the key, is your, the joy of God in your life. And, and one of the, I think it was Pastor Chris was talking, joy is not happiness, joy is a disposition, it's who you are in your relationship with God. And it was their joy or their disposition in, in the relationship with God. And he says, he says that in the great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality or their generosity. Yeah. Amen. 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 
He says, for I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability. So not only was it within what they had, but when God instructed them, they went beyond what they had. Listen to this. He says, and they gave of their own accord, begging with us, much urging, and the favor of participation in the support of the saints. In other words, giving into the work of God. Amen. Let me tell you, that's the best place that you can invest your finances, is giving into the place of God. Why? Because it has eternal consequences. Eternal rewards. Amen? Are you still getting this? You're still with me? Now, listen to this. And this... Not as we had expected, because so often we look at people and we look at what they have and we don't expect generosity from them because we consider where they are. And yet, you know, I was busy watching a YouTube thing about this guy who was a homeless guy and this guy walked up to him and, said, and gave him a hundred dollars. And the guy walked and he went into a supermarket and he took the hundred dollars and he went and bought food and groceries and everything else that he had and then he went and the guy followed him with his camera went and followed him secret camera followed him and then he went into a field where there were other lots of other homeless people living in the field and he started giving out to them and giving from that that he had received he started being generous. So, so often we think when someone gets $100, they're gonna, he's going to keep it. But when you've been in a position of lack and somebody or God has come through for you, you automatically become very generous in that which you have. Yes. And so it goes on, it says there, and this is not that we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. And then he says, and so we urge you, Titus, that as he had previously made a beginning, so he would also complete in you this gracious work. For, but just as you abound in everything, in faith, in utterance, in knowledge, and in all earnestness, and in the love we inspired in you, see that you abound in this gracious work also, this work of generosity. And generosity, you know, I, uh, I can tell you story after story, but just to... Just to establish a principle and a pattern the Bible is full of principles and patterns how many of you know that how many of you know that so what was happening in the New Testament was things that had already happened previously in the Old Testament and all the way through the Old Testament now if you go to 1st Kings chapter 17 we hear where God instructs Elijah to go to the widow and that the widow was going to take care of her Amen? And the, by the way, and so he says, uh, uh, and verse 12, I'm reading from verse 12. But she said, as the Lord God lives, I have no bread, only a handful of flour in a bowl and a little oil in a jar. And behold, I'm gathering a few sticks so that I may go in and prepare for me and my son that we may eat it and die. And so he says to her, then Elijah said to her, do not fear, go and do as you have said, but make me a little bread Take from it first and bring it to me, and afterward you may make one for yourself and for your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bowl of flour shall not be exhausted, nor shall the jar of oil be empty, until the day that the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth. And that was three and a half years that the bowl of flour never ran out, and the oil never ran out. In her lack... She became generous, and that caused a door of prosperity to flow into her life. Are you with me? Are you still out there? Okay, some of you are not convinced. Okay, go with me to 2 Kings chapter 4. And so here we have now a certain, from verse 1, now a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophet cried to Elisha, your servant, my husband is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditors has come to take my two children and to be his slave. Elisha said, what shall I do for you? And tell me, what do you have in your house? 
And she says, and she said, the maidservant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Then she said, go borrow vessels as large for yourself and from all your neighbors, even the empty ones. Do not get a few and you shall go in and shut the door behind you and you and your son shall pour it out into the vessels and you shall set aside what is full. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons and they were bringing the vessels to her and she poured. And when the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another. And he said to her, there is no more vessels. And the oil stopped. Then she came and told the man of God. And he said, go sell the oil, pay your debt, and you and your sons can live on the rest. You see, when you're generous to the things of God, even in, in the place of what you consider is not a generous gift, to God, God sees more the joy of generosity that is in you than what is the amount that is required of you. Hello? In 1997, I want to testify, in 1997, we were about to start the Bible school in, in Bristol here, and uh, we, were, we were believing God. We had no money, and that July, we went to a conference in, in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and there in the conference, both Michelle and I, and let me tell you, we didn't even, someone bought our tickets to go there. Someone paid our hotel bill. We had absolutely squat, no money. All the money that we had had, we'd invested into the start of the work. It ran out six months into the start of work. There was nothing. We were virtually living supernaturally by the grace of God each month and every day. And let me tell you, I can tell you story after story. We have the books to show you. I don't know how we paid our rent and our water and our lights and our telephone and our food each month, but God took care of it. And we sat in the conference, and in the conference, um, God said to me, double up on your giving. And I'm thinking, double up on your giving? Do you know the state of my bank account? And he says, I know the state of your bank account. That's why I want you to double up. I turned to Michelle and I said, the Lord just spoke to me, said we need to double up on our giving. And she looked at me and she said, the Lord said exactly the same thing to me. We need to double up on our giving. And let me tell you, when, when you look at the, how little you have and then God requires you to give double of the little you have, you think this is insane. When your bank account is running in the red, it goes to deep purple the, the more you give. It's just, I mean, it's just, it doesn't exist after that. But we were obedient. That was in the July. We were going to start the Bible school, and we were going around looking for premises, and we found the premises. Were you with us by then? You were with us by then. So you know I'm not talking out of my left ear. And we found, were you with me when we found the premises? You were with me when we went to look at the YMCA here in Totterdown. And there was the building, and, and the, the lady was showing us around, and there in the room was exactly what we needed for the Bible school. And I said to the lady, how much is it a month? And she said, well, 700 pounds a month if you have it every day. And then there's a little side, little room on the side. Of the, I mean, it's, it's, it's full of paint and stuff, but you can have that as an office. So I said, I'll take it. When do you want the money? She says, no, no, you can give it to us at the end of the month. That was in September. That day I got home. I said to Michelle, I found premises, but we got no books. We got no computers. We got nothing. And... Um, a few weeks earlier to that, we received this very strange phone call after we started doubling up on our giving. See, the strange phone call, somebody said to me, you know, listen, uh, we want to give in to your cause. Can we have your bank account details? I'm thinking, you can have them all, man. There's nothing there. You can have it all. And so anyway, so and we forgot about it and we gave them and we just forgot about it and we moved on. And so um, that day that I came home and I said to her, I said, hey, babe, we found premises, but it's like 700 pounds. And we're talking 20 years ago. 700 pounds. And she looked at me and she said, remember that strange phone call you got? I said, yeah, I remember it. She says, well, um, went to the bank today and money has come into our bank account. How much do you think is coming? And I'm, of course, me, a mighty man of faith. I just looked at my immediate needs for the next month, and I said, man, 5,000 pounds, 5,000 pounds, hallelujah. That would really just make a difference today. You see, it's not the amount, it's the attitude of heart. That's what I'm trying to get through to you. They're in their exceeding joy, in their deep poverty, they gave. 
You see, we always think it's the amount. It's never the amount. It's the motivation behind the amount. And so when God spoke through that obedience, and we were joyful in it. <laughs> Let me tell you, God has asked us to do some, some things over the years. And that's why prosperity has never, has never been a lack for us. It's always pursued us. Because I'm always obedient to when God tells me or instructs me. When He tells me to give away something, I give it away. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And so she says, I said, 5,000 pounds. She says, no. Oh, mighty man of faith. <laughs> oh, I said, 10,000. She says, no, a little higher than 10,000. By that time, you know, I'm not a man of patience. Those that know me. <laughs> yeah. It's only when the anointing hits me that I can be very patient. And so I said to a woman, you know, whenever a man says woman, you must know, woman. It's like when she talks to me or when I'm, I'm, when I'm, when I'm going to do something wrong, it's darling. But when she wants something from me, it's babe. And so, of course, when, when, when I want something from her, it's mesh. But when she's irritating me, it's woman. I said, just tell me how much it is. Don't mess around with me. Just tell me how much it is. And she said, well, 125,000 pounds came into our bank account. Now, if you equate the doubling up to the prosperity of God and the attitude and the joy, you, can, you can't do the numbers. The numbers are impossible. And from that, we took that and we tied on that money. We were able to do the Bible school. We were able to do so many things. And from those finances, we, we, we got Unit D down at, remember Unit D? We opened up and we got Unit D. We were able to fix it. And every bit of that money, every single cent of that money went into the ministry. It was put into my private account. I could have taken back and gone back to Africa and been a millionaire. <laughs> But it wasn't my money. It was his money. That's why prosperity pursues me. The favor of God pursues me. Amen. 20 years ago when we left Africa, we gave all our furniture away. We came here and we served here for 20 years. And then God took us to America. And when we got into America and we were getting into the house that we're now living in Houston. When the guy said to me, when's your furniture coming? I said, no, we, we live by faith. God is going to supply furniture for us and we will do. And so we come. The day that we went to get the keys, we walked into a house. And uh, we looked at the house and we thought the house had not been vacated. We thought the previous people had not removed the furniture. And then we stood there and we kind of were just kind of really, you know, out of sorts. And uh, the, I, we said, uh, you know, uh, whose furniture is this? And the guy said, it's yours furniture. He says, when I heard you were coming as a missionary, he says, me and my home group, and they were Baptist, and I'm a raving Pentecostal. <laughs> I want you to know the Baptists are generous people. Amen. They understand prosperity. Amen. They just don't like preaching it like we do. <laughs> Amen. And immediately, the house was fully furnished. And I mean, Wayne has seen the, the, the blessing of God, and uh, Dave has been there, and, and who else? And John has been there. Oh, and yeah, well, Chris has been there too. And Michael's coming to promise me he's coming to visit me too there. And a house full of furniture. You see, I've forgotten what I'd given to, to the work of the ministry 20 years earlier. But God never forgets on your giving. Do you understand? And so the, the, the attitude of generosity must be that you trust God. The joy of giving is that you trust God. You don't look at what you have in the bank account. You hear what God is saying for you to do and then do it. But do it not grudgingly, not out of necessity, but with a joyful heart. When you begin to do it, then you see the prosperity of God released in your life. Amen. Amen. So... Even the building that we're now in, in the church, and all the facilities and everything else, we now have a full band. Have you got that on the screen? Show them the full band? No? Okay. We'll do that maybe on Sunday. Oh, there we go. We now have a full worship team. Amen. Isn't that amazing? That's a full worship team. 
Yeah, and you see the drums, new set of drums, new piano, new everything. Fully paid for by the generosity of God. Because when you obey God, listen to me, when you obey God, you cannot outgive God. If you're addicted to giving, God will support your habit. I'm trying to encourage you to break free from the mentality of looking at what you have and listen to what he says. Because what he says, and that's what the prophet said to the woman. He said, first make me a cake. First honor the prophet of God. And same with Elijah. Elijah said, just go and get the oil and fill up. Because your husband served faithfully the prophets of God. God is going to take care of you and your family. That was the Macedonian church. They wanted to take care of the saints in Jerusalem who were going through a famine in that time. And, they, and they, the, this generosity took hold of them. And they gave. The Bible, the Bible says that after that, they never lacked again. Oh, come on. Because the Apostle Paul was writing to the Corinthian church, telling them, I want this grace to be in you as well. What was the grace? The grace of abundance of the prosperity of God in their life. Like the Macedonian church. When the Macedonian church gave out of their sense of need, God supplied in the, His grace their abundance. If you lack... Consider your joy quota. If you lack, consider your generosity quota. If you lack, consider your obedience quota. Because I know my God shall supply all your needs according to His riches in glory. Christ became poor that through his poverty, we may be made rich in his abundance. You've got to understand, heaven is paved with streets of gold. Are you out there? Amen. And so I really just want to stir you up. This has kind of been bubbling in my heart to come and stir the congregation up. And don't look at what the amount is and look at what is in your hand. But consider the joy quota in your heart. Consider the, the hearing quota of God. Consider the obedience quota that God is asking you to do. Because for some person it might be too much. For somebody else it might be a whole heap more. But it's, they gave in their ability. And here's the thing, beyond their ability. When God required of us to give beyond our ability, we began to see the breakthrough. We never lacked. We bought this building in 2006 with no money in the bank. I think we owe 112. We now owe 112. We bought it for 750,000 pounds. We now own 112 and I'm believing that that's going to soon disappear. Amen. This building is now worth 1.5 million. Look at the mathematics of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? He is a God of abundance. But what we need to hear is we need to tap in. First and foremost, our giving must not be in compulsion. It must be a joy. Something that we, we, we are joyful about doing. Something that when God speaks, you obey. Because that's a big problem that we have. You see, if those, if those two widows did not obey what God had spoken to them through the prophet, they would have lacked. But because they had heard, and because they followed through, the abundance of God was there. Three and a half years, that oil and that flower never ran out because the rains came. The Bible tells us the rains. When uh, Abraham prayed for the rains, the rains came. And there was no longer famine in the land. In the midst of famine, God was taking care of them. Amen. Can you say amen? amen. In the midst of famine in Macedonia, they broke the, 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 the spirit of poverty on them. And they then took hold of the spirit of prosperity on them. That's why I teach these things. That's why I'm excited about it. Because I know that it's worked. It's worked in my life, not once, not twice, many times over. You know, we always talk about good soil. Elijah was good soil. Elisha was good soil. Jerusalem Council was good soil. 
come out as good soil. In other words, you, you're investing in people who are taking the gospel and teaching the unadulterated word of God. Not the diluted, diluted word of God where it's compromise this and compromise that. And we then embrace all the LGBs, UBGs, YBGs and YBGs, whatever else you want to call it. We stand and we teach the truth because we know if you know the truth, the truth will make you free. And it's the same way if you're walking in lack. Let me tell you about the truth. The truth will make you free. When you begin to... Uh, increase your joy quota in your life and your obedience to the instructions of God, you'll begin to walk in the abundance like you've never known before in your life. Amen? Are you ready to give? Are you ready to give? Are you ready to give? Amen. Do what the Lord tells you to do. Don't do. This is, I'm not trying to get you emotionally stirred up. If you don't want to give squat, that's fine. If that's what the Lord says, don't give anything, don't give anything. But I yet to find God ever tell you not to give anything. Even when you walk in the streets and there is a homeless person, he says, be generous. I didn't say collect it. You're in a hurry. 